Um, well, I, uh, before I jump too far into the message, I need to make a confession. And this is not going to be a popular thing I'm about to say, um, but it's, you know, confession is good for the soul. And uh, I love the Mission Impossible movies. I love them. I love them. And I know they're not for everybody. I'm not saying that the Mission Impossible movies are like great cinema or even art. I, no, they're not art. They are the same thing over and over again. Tom Cruise playing Ethan Hunt, and uh, he starts out doing something adventurous and action-oriented, and then solves it, and is like, all right, I'm going to hang up my mission badge, and I'm going to go back to being a normal person, and then like something happens where he's like, brings him back in, and over and over again, every two years, they keep making them, and I keep falling for it every time. I love these movies. And I love it because the more impossible the mission seems, the more I want to see if it is actually possible. Turns out so far every time. I mean, he could be dealing from the fallout of some rogue nation's ghost protocol or whatever ridiculous title comes up next. That I don't know. But every time, like, I got to see this movie. It's going to be so good. And, and I love it because of the, the, you know, the action and all of that stuff. But I also, I love that Ethan Hunt, the protagonist, he doesn't do it all by himself. He always has a team. He's got his crew. And every movie, he has to go and get them back. Like, I know you retired to a nice, quiet island in the Mediterranean. I know you are running a bookshop in Paris. I know that you're just now, like, running a farm. I know, but I need you, man. You're the best computer hacker, ninja skills person ever. And they all have all just the right skills and just the right team. It's perfect. And every time, I'm like, I got to watch this movie. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to love it. And now Alec Baldwin is in them. And I mean, come on. So much fun. I love these movies. And now, why am I telling you this? And some of you guys were worried when I said I had a confession to make. Like, oh man, what's going on? It's, this doesn't really matter. This movie doesn't really matter at all. But I'm going to make one of the cheesiest transitions in the history of this church. So just gear up. Today, we're talking about the mission of Jesus. <laughs> right? And so Mission Impossible, oh, I see. I see. And we're talking about the mission of Jesus as part of our Remember series, because as followers of Jesus, we're all called as the body of Christ to carry on the work of Jesus. And as, just as Ethan has his crew of people, like one of the things that we need to keep in mind as followers of Jesus is we carry out the mission together. We need us the mission isn't just for the pastors or the missionaries who go to the other side of the world to tell people about Jesus. The mission is all of us working together wherever God sends us. And, and our big idea today is this. I am called into God's mission. Everybody say that with me. I am called into God's mission. All right, you are awake. Good. This is already going way better than the 930 service uh, because... You guys are up. You're ready to go. I don't know if you're eager for the Seahawks game. I don't know what it is, but we are also ready for Jesus. Um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, but we're excited, and, and, and God is doing amazing things in his church around the world, but also he wants to do amazing things right here in our community. But we have to own the mission that Jesus has given to us. And, and so today, we're going to look at two passages of Scripture. The first one, Matthew 28, 18 and through 20, which is the Great Commission. And if you have been in a church for any period of time, you have probably heard the pastor talk about this verse, but it is one of the most profound and powerful reminders to us today about the mission that Jesus is calling us into. And if you want to follow along in the chair Bibles, it's on page uh, 698 in those Bibles. You can also follow along in the Creekside app. All the notes are there as well. You can also follow along right behind me. All the text will be up there uh, and you can write down notes on your note sheet. Um, and uh, yeah, so as we walk through uh, this passage, uh, it is, there's, there's some interesting things that if you've heard it a bunch of times, you might just kind of skip over. And, and today I want to not just skip over them. And so we're going to jump in at 2818. It starts with this. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, this passage is the Great Commission. 
If you have been to a church where they ever talked about missions, uh, global missions, they probably talked about this verse. I grew up in a church where every June we had a missions convention. That was basically every Sunday a missionary came into town and we talked about missions. And over and over again, they came to this passage and said, this is why I'm going to India. This is why I'm going to Africa. This is why I'm going wherever the Lord is leading me. And it was always going far away. But the mission that Jesus is giving to his disciples is, is not just for the people who go far away. It's a mission for all of us. And, and so let's unpack it a little bit. Because this commissioning statement is not necessarily completely unique in style. During Jesus' ministry, there were these kings and emperors called Caesar. And, and Caesar would conquer a region, and he would send ambassadors over to that region to proclaim the good news of Caesar. Does this sound familiar? The good news, proclaiming. And, and part of that proclamation is the Caesar would clare, declare, I am the authority in this region. You're welcome. That's basically how the Caesar message went down. I'm summarizing it for all of us who don't speak Latin, like myself. I, um, but it's basically, I'm the Caesar, you're welcome, cool. Uh, Jesus is taking a, a, a common pronouncement and he's making it even more powerful because the Caesar would claim authority, but Jesus is claiming all authority in heaven and on earth. And how can he claim all authority in heaven and on earth? Well, Jesus, the Son of God, laid his life down on the cross. And on the cross, Jesus confronted the first of the greatest enemies of all of mankind, sin. Jesus defeated the power of sin in our lives through his death on the cross. That's good news. Because sin is not just our behavior. Sin is the natural default of our heart. It's what we're drawn to, what we're pulled toward. We find ourselves over and over again not wanting to do a thing, but we keep doing it. That's the power of sin in our, in our life. But Jesus came to change our heart, to change what, what we love, to change what pulls us towards God instead of away from God. And so he defeated the power of sin. And you know what? We still face temptation. We, feel, we still face, uh, face sin and struggle. But when we face those moments of temptation, we have a way out. We have a way forward where we can say, God has defeated this temptation. God has defeated the sin. I'm no longer a part of that kingdom. I'm a part of Jesus' kingdom. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to Jesus. So he defeated the power of sin through the cross. And then three days later, he defeated the power of death when he was raised from the grave. Jesus is alive. And that's good news. Because every single person who has ever walked this earth has to, had, had to have a confrontation with sin and death. And Jesus confronted both on the cross and through the resurrection. He defeated both. And so there is nothing that is going to keep Jesus down. All authority in heaven and on earth belongs to Jesus. Amen? That is good news. And so, unlike Caesar, who can say, I'm the temporary ruler over this region, Jesus is like, nothing's going to stop me. There's a song that they play at the Seahawks uh, games that I love. Not Bittersweet Symphony, which is the opening. And if you've ever been to a Seahawks game, why are you playing that song? It's bittersweet. We want to win, guys. Anyway, got to get off that soapbox. So, but they play this thing where like maybe the team's like under pressure and they're like, all right, guys, we got to rally. We got to rally. We got to rally. And it's like, these haters can't hold me back. These haters can't hold me back. You guys know this song? Am I the only person? All right. I see a couple head nods. All right. Kathy loves this song. She has different words, but she loves it. Um, you can ask her later. Uh, but but that, those kinds of songs where it's like, yeah, we got this. That's what Jesus is saying here. Nothing can hold me back. All authority in heaven and earth belongs to Jesus, and he earned it for you. And so he is commissioning his disciples here as the ultimate, absolute authority. So as the ultimate, absolute authority, we should do what he says. All authority has been given to him. Go, therefore, and make disciples. 
And so often, people put the emphasis on the going. And that's why we start to think, well, go to all nations and make disciples. Yeah, we better go far away. This is great for missionaries, but I'm not a missionary, so I'm just going to be, I'm just going to pray, pray them out. But the emphasis in the language is not supposed to be on the going. It's on the making. And the best way to read this passage is, as you go to all nations, wherever you go, make disciples. You are a disciple maker. I am a disciple maker. Our primary goal is to make disciples. But what does that mean? Because so often, we have a tendency to talk about our faith as simply a, a list of things that we hold in our head. I agree with these statements. I am a Christian. But just knowing something is not what discipleship means. Discipleship requires action. Now, I am not a plumber. You may be surprised. I am not what you call handy. I... I, I skipped a lot of instruction from my dad when he was out fixing the brakes on my car. I said, thanks. I didn't go out and watch. And so now I'm 38 years old, and I have to look things up on the internet to learn how to do stuff, because I didn't take time to learn from my dad. And so like, if you want to be a mechanic, you got to have a season where you work alongside an expert work alongside a master, you apprentice with them, and you work and you learn how to do it together, and then you can go and do it. Same with a plumber. You don't just go out, you, you should not just go out at, t tonight and say, hey, everybody, I'm a plumber. List, I'm listed on Facebook under my name and plumbing. Trust me. No, you need to have a master-apprentice relationship where they learn and they grow together, and then you learn the principles of, of plumbing, and you develop together, and then you can go and apprentice somebody else, and it goes on and on and on. And the same is true with discipleship. It's not just like, oh, do you learn all, did you learn all this stuff? No, it's like, what are you doing with it? What are you doing with the things that you know? Because discipleship requires action. It requires a commitment and obedience to, to teach all that Jesus has commanded us to do and to obey those things personally and model them for other people. That's disciple making. And we're all called to do that. We're called to go make disciples. And so he says two things specifically as you make disciples. First is baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And baptism is important because baptism is a public declaration that you are declaring that you are no longer a citizen of the kingdom of darkness and death, but you are a kingdom, a citizen of the kingdom of God. That you have come into Jesus' kingdom and Jesus has ultimate authority authority over you, and you are pledging allegiance over any nationality, over any earthly leader, you say, it's King Jesus all the time. All the time. And as followers of Jesus, we need to keep that in mind. It is Jesus and his kingdom that we seek to glorify always. Always, always, always. And baptism is a celebration of that. When people put their faith in Jesus, we celebrate that we are welcoming one more person into the family of God, into the kingdom of God, into the work of God. You ever, you ever have a, a hire somebody new on your team and you throw like a lunch party to get to know them? That's baptism. Like we're throwing a little party to say, Let, let's get to know you a little bit. Welcome to the team. We're on board with you and we're celebrating what Jesus is doing in your life. And we do baptisms on the fifth Sunday of every, every month when there is a fifth Sunday. Uh, and so the next one's in December. And so if you haven't been baptized yet, we would love to do that. So keep that in mind. We would love to celebrate that Jesus is stirring your heart into the mission. So that's the first thing. Baptize them to, uh, into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to pledge allegiance to God's kingdom. The second thing is teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Now that's a lot, right? How are we doing on that? Like teaching them to obey all of it? Like I have a hard time remembering uh, like short passages of Scripture. When, and if I'm like in a pressure moment and they're like, memorize some scripture, I'm like, all right, no problem. John 11:35. 35, Jesus wept. Nailed it. <laughs> That's it. I can memorize some scripture, but remembering all that Jesus has commanded and teaching to obey all those things, that seems like a lot. And it seems impossible. But Jesus is such a good teacher. And as you walk through scripture and see what Jesus is teaching over and over again. His, his message was focused on getting back to the heart of God's law. 
came back to the heart of what God was, was teaching and commanding his people. Because the heart of God's law is life and freedom and peace and learning how to, to live in relationship with other people. And Jesus' teaching was always coming back to the heart of the law. And when asked, when people asked him, like, Jesus, what's the most important commandment? He responded with two commands. The first one is love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Another way to say that is love God with your whole self. Everything that makes you, you, love God with that. How would our world be different as, as followers of Jesus, as disciple makers, if our first priority was today I'm going to wake up and I'm going to love God with waking up? Let's start there, guys. I mean, some of us, we wake up like, do I have to? Do I have to get up today? We got to start somewhere. Start there. Jesus, I love you today. Start there. And every thought that you have, if it doesn't glorify God, recognize it and say, God, help me to glorify you with my thoughts, with my actions, with my emotions. Help me to find glory for you in all of those things. Love God with your whole self. We'll talk more about worship next week as we're walking through this, this series about remember and being a part of the body of Christ and, and how worship is a key part of that. But it starts with loving God with your whole self. The second one is love your neighbor as you love yourself. If we can do those two things, our lives will be drastically different. Because instead of trying to satisfy our own temptation and our own desires, we're going to love God with everything that makes me me. And instead of trying to get my way all the time and trying to prove I'm right about everything, I'm going to start saying, okay, well, how can I bless other people? How can I serve the people who need to hear about Jesus right now? And we start to have arrows out, eyes out, looking for ways to love people. And one of the reasons why we need to love people is because every single person that you meet is an image bearer of God. They are made in God's image. And I was talking to an older lady in the first service, and uh, she who said to me this. She, said, she was short, and she said, you're really tall. I said, thank you. I don't know how to take that. Like, I worked at it. Um, thank you. And she said, I'm really short, but God don't make no junk. I was like, that is true. <laughs> that is true. Every single one of us made in God's image. And look, at it, look around. None of us look the same. We're all a little different from everybody else but you still bear God's image. And we should love our neighbor as we love ourselves, because in loving our neighbor, we're loving the image of God in them. And if we love the image of God in them, then we have an opportunity to glorify God and say, God, thank you for bringing this person into my life, even if they drive me crazy sometimes. Thank you for bringing them into my life. Help me love them. Help me tell them the truth. Help me help them understand your love and grace teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you comes down to love the Lord your God with everything that makes you, you, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Can we do that? Can we help other people do that? That's disciple making. That's what God is calling us to do. I uh, got way ahead of my notes here. So um, the next thing that he says in this passage, though, he's going up to the Father. He's, he seems to be leaving but he promises this, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus, our ultimate authority, is with us now. He's with us now. And there's two ways that we might hear something like that. Oh, Jesus is watching, better watch out. Or we can say, Jesus is with me, you better watch out. I'm not afraid of you. These haters can't hold me back. Now it's going to be stuck in your head all day. And you're welcome. Because Jesus is with us. And Jesus knew his disciples were going to face opposition. They were going to face hardship. Following Jesus is not easy. All right, a couple people know the truth. All right, good. Following Jesus is not easy. But we're not alone. We're not alone. And that is good news. And so when we go out into the world, we have this promise from Jesus. Jesus promises his presence with us always to the end of the age. And I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. When's the end of the age? Not yet. So we still have this job to do. We're still called to be ambassadors into the world that God is sending us to. And, and the Apostle Paul in, uh, 
in a letter to the church in Corinth, he talks about this image of being an ambassador. Because of all that, that Jesus has done in rescuing us and transforming our hearts and our lives, he, he gives us a role. And, and in 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 16, it says this, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now this passage is our job description. We were told to go make disciples, and this is our job profile. You're an ambassador. You are going, and you are saying one thing. God has made it possible for you to be reconciled, and he's done that through Jesus. Jesus, through his death on the cross, makes reconciliation with God possible. Now, reconciliation is not a term that we probably like to think about because it reminds me of my checking account. And, you know, that's just drudgery, right? Like, oh, I've got to reconcile my checking account. I've got to make sure all this stuff. And, like, it's just busy work. It feels awful. But really, reconciliation is a relationship term. Something's out of balance. Something's not right. And as we read through Scripture, we realize what that what's, what's out of balance, what's not right, is that our hearts are prone to sin. And that sin separates us from God. But Jesus came to make things right. He came to wipe out our debt of sin. He came to heal our relationship. He came to give us a, a, a peace and purpose in life that, that we can never get on our own. Jesus has made that possible for us. And we might think, well, no, I'm a good person. But our goodness is still, it, we're still in that hole that we dug for ourselves to begin with. And we can't dig our way out. There's a, a show uh, that I like called The Office. Uh, you may have heard of it. Um, it's a small little show. On, it was on NBC a while ago. Um, but there's this episode where Michael, the world's worst boss, uh, is totally upside down financially. He's like in a mess. And um, he hears from one of his coworkers, Creed, that uh, he just needs to go file bankruptcy, it's nature's do-over. That's Creed's words, not mine. <laughs> and so Michael comes out into the office where everybody's working, and he just says, I declare bankruptcy, <laughs> right? And he thinks that did something. <laughs> nope, <laughs> that did nothing. And that's often when people say, like, no, I'm a good person. <laughs> You're still just Michael Scott yelling, I, I declare bankruptcy. It's not doing anything. It's not about how good we are. It's not about us trying to earn our way into heaven. It's recognizing, like, I, I'm totally stuck. I can't do it on my own. I need my relationship healed by Jesus. And that's the reconciliation that God makes possible through Jesus. And every Sunday at Creekside, we make much of what Jesus has done for us. We do that through our singing. We do that through celebrating communion together. And every Sunday, we give an opportunity to say, yes, I, I need that. I need somebody to fix my life. I need somebody to help get me on the right path. I need somebody to, to forgive my sin, my brokenness. I need hope. I need peace. And, and today, if you are not yet following Jesus, today is the best day. It's the best day to say yes to him. And on your Discover card, there's a, a place on the back where you can mark become a follower of Jesus. And, and we're going to, in a few moments, we're going to pray, and I'm going to ask you to say yes to Jesus. And if you are saying that for the first time, please mark that on your Discover card. And if you know, I need Jesus. And as, uh, as we follow after Jesus, then we jump in to the work that Jesus has given us to be ambassadors. And, you know, just geopolitically, ambassadors represent their government to another nation. And so we have ambassadors as Americans all over the world that go and they are basically representatives of the United States of America to wherever. 
But for followers of Jesus, for Christ's ambassadors, we represent Jesus' kingdom to the world. We represent his work, his story, his salvation. We are ambassadors and people are watching us. How are we doing representing the kingdom of God in this world? Are we loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? And are we loving our neighbor as we love ourselves? Because that's what Jesus wants us to be doing. And as we do that, we will live distinct and different lives. We will stand out and we'll have an opportunity to share what God has done in our lives. Last week, we talked about remembering the story of God. And as we remember the mission, that story is a key part because we say like, this is what God has done throughout history. This is his plan to rescue lost people. And we also can say, this is how God has rescued me. And so I gave you the assignment last week of writing out your faith story. And, I, and I'm praying that you have opportunity to, to share that. And if you, you wrote that story out, it was not in vain. It was to give you an opportunity to, to share what Jesus is doing and help you think about and remember God's story in your life. And as we remember God's mission then, our job is to be an ambassador and to proclaim the freedom that Christ has already accomplished for us. It's not you, ambassador, who wins the battle. It's not you who goes in and says, I'm going to make your sins forgiven. It's not you. You are just going in the authority and power and presence of Jesus to all nations, wherever you go, proclaiming, there is a king who loves you. There is a king who died for you. There is a king who wants you to be a part of his family. And that's our job, inviting people into the family of God. Now, I have some next steps that I want to ask you to join me in. And these next steps are going to require some participation. So gear up. This first service, I asked everybody, I'm going to ask you the same thing. Let's all take out our Discover card. All right. I need everybody in this room, everybody. And if you're like, I'm too cool for that, I, I've got news for you. You're not. Um, you're not too cool for this. Everybody, I need you to take out your Discover card because we're going to have a moment of commitment. This is where if you are saying, yes, I know I need Jesus, right here on your just next steps to say, become a follower of Jesus. But one of the cards I'm going to ask everybody to, to respond to here, the first thing is, I will accept my mission. You know, our mission seems big. It seems bigger than anything we can do on our own, but Jesus is with us. We don't go out there on our own. We don't go to your school. We don't go to your work. We don't go to all the places that Jesus sends us by ourselves. We go in the presence of Jesus. Will you accept your mission? And if you will, mark that on, the, on your card. I will accept my mission. The second thing I want to ask you is um, about where Jesus is sending you. I am an ambassador too. Because you're going to go places I'm never going to go. And that's okay. But, you know, I wrote down, as I was thinking about this, I need to write down my own places to go and where Jesus is sending me. And one of the places where I have the most enriching spiritual conversations, sometimes with people I don't even know, is the Barnes & Noble Cafe. I office there at least once a week. Just work on messages and just, I'm just there. And sometimes I have these great conversations with people and I recognize that I'm an ambassador to Barnes & Noble. That, that is part of my mission field. But also, like my neighborhood, my wife and I, we live across the street from like a, like a, a bevy of retired people. Um, I don't know how much a bevy is, but it's about that much. Um, <laughs> Just a, a lot of people who've lived on this neighborhood for decades. And Kathy told one person what we do for a living. And like in the next day, they all came over and said, so I hear you're a pastor. <laughs> it's like, cool, dude. Awesome. That got out fast. Um, it's not like, I'm, I'm not ashamed of it, but it's like, oh, I didn't talk to you. <laughs> so they're all talking. And, and so we are ambassadors to our neighborhood. And this last summer, I had an opportunity to do a memorial service for my neighbor who passed away. And these, this is a family that doesn't go to church. They have some Catholic background. Their extended family doesn't go to church. But they said, we need a pastor. We need somebody who can serve our family in this time. And so I got to go and 
preach the gospel. But I had to be present in my neighborhood. And I had to have my eyes out to say, this is my mission field. And so where has Jesus sent you? Where are you an ambassador? Can you write that down on your card? It could be your workplace, it could be school, it could be your neighborhood, it could be your family. You might be the only follower of Jesus in your family. Jesus is not afraid of that. He sent you there for a reason. And then I also want to ask you to be praying for some people. Who are some names on your, that you can write down on your card that you want to be praying for specifically? Because this is part of being an ambassador. This is part of being a witness. This is part of disciple making is saying, like, I am going to share with these people what Jesus has done in my life. So write those things down. And then now this is where I'm going to ask you to do something bold. If you are saying, yeah, I will accept my mission, then I'm going to ask you to come to the front right now. Just because I want to pray for you. Because we are called to Christ's mission. I'm going to ask you just to leave your Discover card on the platform. These are the Discover cards from the 930 service. I picked them up so that nobody would be like, oh, I see what they're doing here. They're going to ask me to get up out of my seat. Yep, we are. But every one of these cards represents a missionary. They represent people who are far from Jesus. And I know we sort these cards, Shannon, for the service and everything, but we're just going to let it be this time. It's okay. But these are our friends and our family members. These are the people that God is calling us to. And I thank you for, for saying, yeah, I'm a part of this mission. And we're going to pray for these folks. And, and if you're not able to come up front, maybe walking or standing is difficult for you. And in a moment when I pray, I'm going to just ask you to lift your hand up. And, and we'll include you in this prayer. But I am proud of you for, for saying, yes, I want to be a part of the mission of Jesus. And one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you all up front is because sometimes we go out into the world and we feel alone. We feel like we, are, we don't have anybody with us there. Like I go to Barnes & Noble and I sit by myself and I might feel alone. But sometimes seeing that other people are on the mission field with you can bring courage to your heart. You are not alone. And some of you guys work in the same place. <laughs> some of you guys like, are in the same school. Some of you guys might be in the same school district. Some of you guys have these connections where you're like, oh yeah, we're not alone. We're not alone. But then also we need to remember that Christ is with us always to the very end of the age. You are not alone. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. And I'm going to ask you uh, to pray with me at, at a, just a conversational level. You don't have to yell or anything, but pray for the names that you wrote down. Pray for the places that you wrote down. And, and we're going to pray together. So I need you to pray out loud. Just like when we ask you to clap, we're asking you to make some noise. I'm going to ask you to make some noise in, in church today. Is that all right? Okay, let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for calling your church into your work to carry on your mission. And so, Lord, we ask that you would empower us by your spirit to go into our schools, to go into our workplaces, to be present in our neighborhoods, in our families as ambassadors of Jesus. And, and Lord, we ask that you would be a part of every decision we make as we love you with all that we are, as we love our neighbor, as we love ourselves. Lord, we pray that us glorifying you would draw people to us, that they would ask us how our life is different and why, and we would tell them the story. And so, Lord, we thank you that you are calling us today to your work and to your glory in all things. And so, Lord, we pray for boldness. We pray for compassion. We pray for love. And we pray for mercy as we serve and love and proclaim your good news everywhere we go. And now I'm going to ask with every head bowed and every eye closed. Now, if you are not yet following Jesus, I'm going to ask you just right where you're at. To just, and you know you need Jesus. If you are ready to say, yes, I need Jesus, would you just put your hand up? If you know that you need Jesus today, I don't want to miss this opportunity for, for people to trust Jesus together. All right, I see your hand. Okay. 
Okay. All right. And now I'm going to ask everybody in this whole room to repeat after me because we all have moments where we need to recommit and for some of us commit for the first time. And so, Lord, I'm, uh, repeat these words after me. Thank you, Jesus, Thank you, Jesus. for your cross, for, your cross. for forgiving, my sin. forgiving my sin. Help me, Jesus, Help me, Jesus. To, trust you to trust you in the face of temptation, in the face of, temptation. In the face of, weakness. In the face of weakness. Lord, to find strength in you. And Father, help me, Father, help me. To, tell to tell your story, to bring you glory, to bring you glory. Wherever, I go. wherever I go. Thank you, Lord, Thank you, Lord. For, all you for all you are doing. I am trusting you. I am trusting you. Amen. 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 Amen.